Assalamu alaikum. My name is Siddhartha Phillips. I'm a Muslim revert and I'm living in Istanbul. Uh, alhamdulillah, with my wife and two daughters. Uh, we're doing well, alhamdulillah. So, um, we we're talking about my upbringing, and I guess what we're really talking about there is what it meant to grow up <laughs> as somebody with a really mixed up background. <laughs> so, I call myself a third culture kid, right? And uh, that has different meanings for different people. But what it basically means is that you don't have like one place that you fit in. Uh, you know, your parents are from two different places or you moved around a lot. For me, it meant that my parents grew up in two vastly different places uh, with different backgrounds, different cultures, different religions. So that makes it a bit interesting for me to find my own identity, you know. So, uh, I mean, something that comes to mind is my name. My name is, my full name is Siddhartha Alexander Phillips. Uh, Siddhartha, if you haven't heard the name before, is the name of the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, uh, before he reached enlightenment and nirvana. And most people are like, oh, is that because you're Hindu? Are you Buddhist? Like, how does that work exactly? And the main story that I know is that my mom read the Herman Hess book, uh, which I think a lot of people are have a deep connection with, uh, especially the ones who've read it. Uh, and so that's where my name comes from. So it's a big weight to bear, honestly, and uh, it kind of highlights, um, in a way, how I develop my own religious or spiritual journey. You know, um, growing up, <clears throat> Uh, my mom wasn't super religious. I think she was kind of anti-organized religion, but pro-human spirituality. I mean, she really believed in this like spiritual core of people and the way that's expressed through, you know, love and poetry and art um, and dance. Um, and I think she really sees that beauty of, you know, uh, you know, really the the poetry of creation. You know, Allah's poetry in, in his creation. So, my dad, on the other hand, had a lot more cultural baggage, almost. So, uh, growing up as a Balinese Hindu Buddhist, uh, you know, it's called Bali Hindu, but it's really a fusion of so many things. The Balinese belief system, there's, uh, I mean, by name it has Hinduism. They share some uh, depictions of deities that are shared with, uh, you know, standard uh, Hinduism in India, uh, so like the Ganesh with the elephant head and Shiva and, um, you know, some more of those deities. Uh, and there's elements of Buddhism when it comes to kind of uh, seeking that perfection of the soul through meditation to escape the cycle of rebirth and achieve nirvana, uh, which even is a concept in, in Islam, which is uh, fana, you know, fana fi Allah, like annihilation into the ultimate truth, annihilation into God. And I truly believe that uh, all of those religions, the ones that I know of personally, are Hinduism, Buddhism and Islam are simply different perspectives and different pathways to the same ultimate goal and the same ultimate destiny which is to achieve this annihilation into the ultimate uh, you know to live our lives to their uh, you know fullest capacity in service to the greater and in service to the divine um, so really uh, you know where some people may have rejected their history and their past belief I embrace it and I transmute it through Islam to create what I believe today. So as a child, I learned to practice Balinese Hinduism in a similar way. I think that a lot of Balinese practice is that as a ritual exercise. And I'm sure this is not limited to Balinese Hinduism, but I think it spreads to all corners of the globe with all cultures and all religions is that um, unfortunately, 
uh, most people it becomes simply an automated uh, reaction, an automated uh, thing. You know, I, I'll fast in Ramadan, you know, using Islam as an example, I'll, you know, uh, you know, do go to the masjid, go to Juma prayer, but that doesn't mean that you have a deeper connection within your soul necessarily, you know, it's uh, you go through the motions. And uh, in Bali, it's, it's uh, uh, in some way, it's similar to that. So, so growing up, I got to experience all of the different cultures, all of the different, uh, not cultures, all the different uh, rites, all of the different ceremonies. Uh, you know, they say that in Bali, if a Balinese person is not uh, in a ceremony, they're preparing for a ceremony. Uh, I think from the history, it's because Bali and Indonesia is such a lush uh, ecology uh, there's so much abundance of resources, of food, of shelter, of uh, you know, water and uh, animals is that to survive, the people there did not have to work in the same way that people living in cold climates had to work when they prepared for the winter. So in a, in a temperate climate, you know, if you look back to early agriculture and, uh, you know, hunter-gatherers, you would have to stockpile food and resources to survive a harsh winter where nothing grows. Whereas in tropical places, uh, you don't have to deal with that. So, you know, a jackfruit falls out of a tree and your village is fed for a week. Uh, so what that results in is, is this culture that's so intricate because people had a lot of free time. So there's so much intricacy in the, in the details and how the offerings are woven and the, and the masks that they use in the ceremonies and the costumes and there's so much depth and beauty and detail in that and um, you know uh, but at the same time it, it results in so much uh, complexity and so much beauty that it becomes hard to find or to understand what that true message is is that it's like okay we got to create all these offerings we got to create all these uh, you know different you know things need to be ready for the ceremony uh, um, uh, and then you're so busy, uh, you know, exhausting yourself by being there, you know, 12 hours standing, carrying around all these different, uh, you know, materials and sitting and watching the beautiful show that, uh, you know, the spiritual core, it's, it's there, but it's uh, hidden in this beautiful complexity. Uh, at least this was my experience. Uh, you know, I, I really appreciate uh, all the people who seek to find truth uh, wherever it's accessible to them and uh, in some places it's much more difficult but what I found is that through Islam uh, it shows me uh, you know a clear path and I think that's what a lot of people are drawn to about Islam is that it, it sets things clear and straight um, you know, there's no, uh, not as much complexity from which to find and extrapolate and pull out the truth. It's right there, plain to see. Um, so as a child, I really just experienced the ritualistic, uh, you know, the, the rituals of the practice of Balinese Hinduism. Uh, my mother was non-religious, uh, you know, she'd follow along, you know, uh, we go and we, and we do what we have to do. Uh, and you know, it's a lot of fun. You get exposed to all these beautiful, uh, you know, elements, the dance and the music. It's really amazing. Um, so the spiritual kind of seeking part of me didn't really come about until I think my dad really started becoming a, a truth seeker as well. Uh, which was when I moved to America when I was 15, I think. I think I was 15, yeah. Uh, so growing up, you know, I fell into the, just being a teenager, you know, uh, you know having fun, uh, you know, art. Art was, was kind of the thing that, that was born in that time period that stays with me to this day, but really there was not a lot of spiritual core going on there. But when I moved to America, I was in such sort of like angsty, teenage, like tumultuous like time that I was like, I got to get out of here. <laughs> I got to reset my life. Uh, it was pretty dramatic at the time. But so I went, I left Bali 
uh, halfway through the school year as like 10th grade or something. Uh, and I went to uh, New Hampshire, a very cold state uh, in the northeastern part of the United States uh, in the middle of winter. So here's this island boy who grew up, uh, you know, in Bali, and then suddenly he's transplanted to some little town uh, that's like all white kids. You know, there, there's some international kids, but in the middle of winter, uh, you know, it's just it's a big shock for me. Uh, but uh, but the curriculum there uh, really helped me. It was um, it was a Waldorf school. So uh, if you haven't heard of it, Waldorf is like kind of like a holistic uh, education system that really focuses on the combination of like uh, arts and sciences, math and, uh, you know, spiritual stories in a way. Uh, you know, if you go to Waldorf school as a kid, which my mom did, actually, she went to Waldorf school through her whole years growing up. Uh, you, ha you need it's required to have an instrument <laughs> and you learn math through your music and vice versa. So it's, it's very interesting. But this period, going from the busy, hot, tropical jungle that is just full of life and energy, for me, it uh, made my mind so crowded and so busy. So um, during this time of finding myself, it made a lot of sense for me to move to, uh, you know, kind of more introspection and more isolation. Which is interesting now because we're all isolated and indoors, aren't we? Uh, so there I was in New Hampshire, middle of winter, disconnected from like everything that I had ever known. Uh, intentionally, I don't know, something in me said that I had to just disconnect, uh, which was great because I found sort of, uh, you know, I, I established that inner compass and listening to that inner voice. So. Um, if you've ever lived in a temperate place with seasons, you know that summer is all about the body. You're going out and about, you're just like, you know, swimming and, you know, eating food and like hang out with your friends and talking. And then winter is when everything goes inside, you know, uh, you become much more introspective. And this was my first winter in my whole life as a teenager. And it really, you know, that introspection brought about a, a different side of me. Um, so while I was there disconnected from everything finding myself or attempting to my dad meanwhile in Bali was kind of doing the same thing so at the time he started to get more into uh, I guess you would call it the spiritual circles the ashram the uh, you know spiritual guidance with gurus and meditation and uh, their teachers and he became connected with that side of the Balinese spirituality uh, and I think that's very much the Buddhist path and he started to really look inwards. Uh, my brother at the same time, my older brother, uh, was studying with the Guru as well. So I was in America learning about um, transcendentalism, uh, you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson escaping into the woods to introspect about his life, our teachers telling us to go into the woods and to introspect about our life and to draw and to journal, which is uh, like, alhamdulillah, a really great experience. Very nurturing to a spiritual child uh, or to the spiritual part of a child. And in Bali, my dad was uh, studying with some meditation masters. Uh, 